This from a brawler, there's three things. One is the martial artist has a footwork. Secondly, the martial artist is not willing to lose. And thirdly, and very importantly, I learned this from the police, a martial artist doesn't get mad. Okay. If a cop is getting mad when he's fighting, then he's doomed. Okay. And the martial artist doesn't get mad. The martial artist stays calm because the martial artist has confidence in his proficiency. And paradoxically, it's not it is. Paradoxically, the better you are in fighting, the less you have to hurt people. And the reason is, is to use minimum force, you have to have confidence in your proficiency. It's the difference between hitting someone on the head and hitting them on a the knee. If you have confidence in your proficiency and your ability to deliver the stroke accurately and in what it will do, then even though you're afraid and your impulse is to knock their head off, you're so afraid, you have confidence in your proficiency and you break their knee it's measured. instead of their head. That's what, what it is. And I have confidence in my proficiency because I've been there a million times. I've fought two or more people with three or four dogs. I've had big guys, well, except for that one guy, they're always going to be bigger than me. I mean, I've had a guy one time in the Chattooga turn right around and get hold of me and everything. The guy was that big, like that man. Looked like an air, and I think he was military, tell the truth, in his haircut. This is over in the Chattooga, it wasn't that far from Fort Gordon or Fort Stewart. And, uh, and get a hold of me and tumble down a mountainside and, and, and still have my shit together and come up with him being on me but not having control of the stick, but having me, and having the guy realize that he was about to get his face knocked in and just dropping me and running away, okay? Because I kept my shit together. I didn't lose it. I was able to take him and flip him off the trail and roll all the way down the mountainside to you know, 15, 20 feet. Him come up on top of me and still have my shit together and be ready to bam, do, use the, that's what I call the extended fist. You have kinetic strokes, and you have power strokes and muscle strokes and the extended best technique is, you know, here's the bat right there. And I use the bat like you're supposed to use it. A lot of police departments hold the bat like that. In other words, a lot of police departments teach you on a 36 inch bat, right control, they teach you to have the strong hand down, but you have the strong hand up, like Money. this. Yeah, you have the strong hand up. And that way you can use the extended fist technique, which the tip of the bayonet is there, uh, the uh, stick is there, and so what that is is this tip of the stick is a extra long and extra hard extension of your fist. Bam! It's awesome. It's devastating. Not only is it very quick acceleration, you know, every, you know, that's where close in work. Okay, for at a distance work, it's going to be a kinetic stroke. Kinetic means moving, and it's kinetic energy. And and in other words, the energy you are imparting into the hit is the energy of something uh, moving. In other words, it's mass times speed right. equals force. Okay, so one of them squared. So the, you visualize the tip of your stick is a projectile, and and the object is to get tip velocity. So you think this and that type of thing translates as far as in a situation like you were just talking about. What this training, this practice, kind of kind of comes out as far as when you were. You said you didn't have to cover a mouth up or anything. Like oh yeah, yeah. It's the calm and the calmness I have. I, you know, anyone else when they w would be doing this, if they weren't a highly skilled martial artist, well, they wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> yeah. They'd, They'd be nervous or what? Well, I don't know what they'd do. I mean, you know, imagine where. It goes back to the pro thing. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it goes back, and it's experience. It's a combination of experience and knowledge. Well, it's like a police officer or like a soldier. The way a cop wins fights, the way a soldier wins fights, is planning, training, and equipment. That's how that's how police officers win fights. Planning, training, and equipment. The planning is doing scenarios. What if two guys and another guy comes this way? What if the guy does that? What if? What if? What if? Planning. Okay. And you rehearse it. And then train, rehearsing. You do your scenarios and equipment, of course. Well, which, taken care of. Uh, which would translate to weapons, you know. Uh, you could call it weapons. Uh, and, and that's what, how police officers win twice. Planning, training, and equipment. You know, that's, that's, that's how, you know, little schmuck police officers can wear that. Because they planned, they trained, they, they, they're equipped.
But uh, Meredith Bell got the best of me there. <laughs> yeah, she did. Oh, but to ask you a question, once, once she goes over the edge, I got her around to the tree. And she said, no, no, don't, don't, don't. But she wasn't yelling anymore. I said, no, honey, don't worry. Listen, I, I just got to go back. I'll be right here. Listen, listen. And I said, and, 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 and also, the first thing I said is, where's your debit card, credit card? In the car, and say, what's the PIN number? One, two, three, four. Okay, look, honey, look, look, look. I got your credit card, I got your PIN number. It's going to hurt you, I hurt you. I'll be back just a second. Go, go, go. Uh, just take it. And she just called my dad. And from then on, she was just cooperating, like, right there. It was like she wasn't even... And, and to take her back down to the parking lot, I had to go through some really thick stuff, cross a really steep ravine, a drainage with a, uh, a uh, stream at the bottom, really steep, about 15 vertical feet or 20 vertical feet, really steep, cross the, the creek and then come up it again through thick roadies, and then take her down the tail end of a boulder field and then cross country straight down to the parking lot. She was unsecured, totally unsecured except just I put a, a loop line around her neck and just like a leash, like a dog's leash, and that's the only way she was secured, okay. And I told her that I had a gun and that, you know, I was going to shoot her ass. Now, I didn't have a gun, but I had this baby that will look like a gun. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was going to shoot her ass down and, you know, she you know, took off running or something. You know, because, <laughs> yeah, you got to do that because most girls could probably outrun me, <laughs> you know, not that fast. And uh, and after that, from then on, she totally cooperated. We we traversed the blood mountain through the stick stuff, down through the drainage up. And every, she was totally cooperative with me and everything else. And it was all the way through. And as time went on, she got more and more cooperative. The last morning, again, I told you that tank truck got stalled and blocked the road or stuck and blocked the road. And he said he was calling for help. And I, I, I said, honey, Look, we gotta get out of here. This guy's calling for help. Come on, just start throwing stuff in. Don't worry, because she she by then knew the procedure for packing and unpacking the van, and she would help me, you know, and how we would do it, and you know, et cetera, what what went where. She she knew it all, and she would help me. And I, but I said, hey, now just grab it and throw it in. Grab it, and she just man was really going crazy. But I want to tell you though. But you know, the advice to people if they're abducted is to engage your abductor and to make yourself a person to them and not have them think of you as an object. To engage them, to tell them your name, to tell them about yourself, tell them about your family, tell them about what you, tell your abductor that, you know, tell them what you study, what your dreams and hopes and plans and schemes are, and, and try to engage them and make yourself a person rather than an object because the abductor is psychopathic, he's looking at you in a in human way. You want to make yourself a human. It was always me. It was always me engaging them. First thing I ask them is, uh, what kind of music you like? What's your favorite song? What do you do for work? Where'd you go for school? What do you like to do? And talk to them. It calms them down. It calms them down. But none of them ever did that to me. Meredith, the whole time, I knew her thing because I saw her, I knew her name, I saw it in the lesson, but I just called her Hun or Honey. I said, come on, huh? come on, let's go. Got to do it. Come on. No, hey, hey, no, huh? come on. Yeah, that kind of thing. She never once told me, hey, my name is Meredith. I mean, that's what I'd be doing. I'd, pit I'd be pitching the guy like hell. They don't even pitch me. Like, really, I won't, I won't say a word, you know. Just, you know, I'd be saying, hey, listen, hey, no sweat. Listen, I'll tell them you had me blind over all the time. I didn't even see nothing. I don't know a thing. I had no good. Hey, I'm not even going to report this. Hey, just cut me loose, you know, cut me loose as soon as you can. If I can get back for a big alarms raised, I'll, I'll never even report. I'd be pitching the whole damn time. I'd be bending. If I was abducted, I'd be bending their fucking ear. You know, engaging them and, and making them think of me as a pr establishing a relationship. You kind of expected that, but never got it. it. You're right. It's amazing. It's totally fucking amazing. It was me. I, I did form a relationship, but that was because of me. Because I, you're it, reaching out. Reaching out to them, and it, it gets their cooperation, because now you're making yourself a person to them. Instead of an inhuman monster, you're making them see as it's just a guy who maybe got a screw loose, but nevertheless just a guy who's 
rational sounding. You know, the act wasn't rational, but my actions otherwise, and, and, and everything is rational, who's intelligent, who's intuitive, you know, who is well-read and educated, and they start to see, they see me as a person, and they see that I have a, an interest in them. You know, again, first thing that I would say is, I mean, right there, I mean, while I'm leading them away, uh, what kind of music do you like? You know, that kind of thing. And asking preferences, things, what do you do, and everything, and tell me about your job. Uh, part of it is I'm curious. You know, if, if, as an artist uh, and as a sociopath, if, if you're doing this, you would like to select your victims on an artistic sense. But when you get down, you procrastinate and yet someone's got a fall. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? But nevertheless, I want to know them and to see what, you know, who I have got rather than just faceless person you're going to kill. There's nothing else, something interesting, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And see, and it's not to say my mind could not have been changed uh, with the right kind of people, but I don't know. You know, I have a rage against society, and I guess most people would fit the bill as far as the victim goes. Yeah, actually. Again, I'm remorseful over Meredith because just for the fact that if nothing else, she drove a Chevy Cavalier. You can't, I can't tell you how much I respect that. Why is that? Why, yep, he's going to drive a little cheap white Chevy Cavalier. My God, you can get a... a no cheap, brand name is what you're saying. You, no Acura, Nothing no Beamer, no, no Sub, okay? You can get a two or three year uh, uh, Cavalier off rental or off leash for four thousand dollars, I mean a new. You can get four. You look in the fucking blue book, okay? You can get a new Cavalier for four, five, six thousand dollars, man. Jesus Christ! And the fact that that girl drove a Chevy Cavalier, I asked her why, and she told me that the sensible reasons and everything. I respected her to no end for that. Yeah. Uh, she didn't have a brain in her head, but hey, neither do you either. And I, you know, hey, you know what the hell? No one does. It, you know? <laughs> Right? You know, that we're all just running. We're all just passing the time. We're all just finding a way, some way to divert ourselves from the the inevitability of our own end. Anything. Divert me. Divert me. Divert me. And by God, don't let me stop and think about it, please. Make me so busy that I can't even think. You know? I can only, you know, just be immersed in the matrix and, you know, everything virtual and nothing's real and just keep it spinning, baby. Keep it spinning. Mm -hmm. Okay? So yeah, she was brain dead, uh, of course. But you know, I, 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 the fact that she drove a Cavalier, the fact that she had this job selling boxes, commercial boxes, okay, you know, to stores and, and displays and everything. It was just a, a, and it was an entry level slot. She's out there calling on stores selling boxes, and she was so optimistic, enthusiastic about it, even though she didn't, you know wasn't passionate about the job. She sold boxes for Pete's sake. But she was happy in it in that she felt she was progressing, building her resume. Six in, as, she, as Meredith says, she said, if I can succeed in selling boxes, then it's going to show the next higher level that, you know, I can go out and do it. If I can go out and sell boxes. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. She was happy in that. She wasn't, did anyone else would be empty you know, bitching about it. No. She was happy to have the job. She was happy to do it. She did it. She was doing good at it. And and sure, her life was just stupid, but the thing is, it was full. And, and she was happy at it. She wasn't dissatisfied. You see, the human condition is to be dissatisfied. That's, that's why we had to settle down and have things and get more and more and more and more. And it's especially the women that are dissatisfied. My God, man, you're having to buy furniture every few years. You're having to buy carpets. They're never fucking happy. And every few years you got to get a bigger house, okay? They are never satisfied. But it's really the human condition is to be dissatisfied. That's why we're at where we're at. I like to use the saying of, well, we wanted to have something to drink, we invented whiskey. Then we wanted a cold drink, we had to invent the refrigerator. We're never satisfied. That's right. She was satisfied. Well, she, she had to share that with you. Huh? I mean, she seemed to share that stuff with you as far as making, you know, 
Oh, oh she no. told me. I, I had questions her. We had oh, long, okay, that, okay. I spent three weeks, three days with her. We had long talks about everything. I gave her a book to read, uh, that uh, Cannibals and Kings. I gave her a choice of books to read. And uh, she selected Cannibal and uh, Kings, uh, Marvin Harris, Anthropologist, 1977. Get it, read it. It'll, it'll explain much of the stuff that I'm telling you. I've been telling you about what's going to happen to us, where we come from, what civilization is, mm -hmm. where it's going and everything. And you'll see that you're fucking dead. But hey, don't worry about it. I mean, why? I mean, just enjoy yourself. So what? You're fucked, okay? Hey, there's just...